Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I, <laughs> I'm Nathan Stretch, and I'm the Division Manager of Community Development for Kitchener Public Library, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's 85 Queen author event. And this time, I would like to introduce tonight's special guests, and then I'll invite them to our stage for a chat. Judith Pereira joined the Globe and Mail in 2001 as an intern at Report on Business magazine while doing her master's degree in publishing at Simon Fraser University. After a stint as a features editor for globeandmail.com, she spent nearly two decades as an editor at the magazine where she won several national newspaper awards for packages and infographics and is now the Globe's arts editor. She became the Globe's books editor in 2019 and the arts and books editor in 2020. Before joining the Globe, she worked for the now defunct Lichtman's, where she learned the importance of recommendations to book sales, and read the slush pile at Penguin Canada, where she discovered nobody. <laughs> Judith has, re has recently interviewed authors on stage for the Toronto Festival of Authors and Eden Mills Festival, and we're thrilled to welcome her to our stage tonight. Welcome, Judith. Charlotte Gray is one of Canada's best-known writers and the author of 12 acclaimed books of literary nonfiction, including The Promise of Canada, The Massey Murder, A Maid, Her Master, and The Trial That Shocked the Country, Murdered Midas, Gold Diggers, Striking It Rich in the Klondike, which was a, a broadcast as a television miniseries. An adjunct research professor in the Department of History at Carleton University, Charlotte has received numerous awards, including the Pierre Burden Award for Distinguished Achievement in Popularizing Canadian History. She is a member of the Order of Canada and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. To read this complete and extensive list of awards, prizes, nominations, appointments, and honors, as well as the volume of her work, including essays, articles, and videos, which is represented here by this massive sheaf, <laughs> I invite you to visit charlottegray.ca. <laughs> Before Charlotte takes to the stage, I would like to read a short review from internationally best-selling author, first lady of Iceland, feminist and Canadian, Eliza Reid. Fascinating, engaging, and thought-provoking insight into the lives and influence of two women whose impact on the course of world events has all too often been reviewed from the male gaze. This book made me develop a greater appreciation for many of the so-called secondary characters we read about in history books. And we are thrilled to welcome Charlotte back to our stage tonight. The last time she was here was for the one book, one community event for the Massey murders. Charlotte was on this stage where she was cross-examined by one of Canada's most famous defense lawyers, Eddie Greenspan. Welcome, Charlotte. Thank you, Nathan, for a wonderful introduction. And thank you, Sheila, for organizing this event. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see you. And I, too, am looking forward to my conversation with Judith, who is, I can tell you, the queen of Canadian books. She does such an important job at the Globe. But we, Judith and I, decided that we'd start with me doing a short reading, and then we'd sit down and chat. I want to read from the preface of Passionate Mothers, Powerful Sons, just to give you a sense of uh, what's going on here. And the preface is called The Pageantry of Power, 1867. Throughout the summer of 1867, the royal carriage clattered regularly along the Champs-Élysées, the imperial crest on its lacquered doors glinting in the Parisian sunlight. The outriders and postillions in green and gold liveries were as impeccable as the four chestnut horses that drew the vehicle. Bystanders stopped to admire the stylish figure sitting in the carriage, her little riding hat set at a jaunty angle, and her billowing silk skirts 
covering the entire width of the seat. The Empress Eugenie, Spanish-born wife of Emperor Napoleon III, was the celebrity of the century. Her glittering jewelry collection included cascades of diamonds, and her wardrobe of 300 gorgeous gowns dictated fashion across two continents. Among those who watched with awe as the carriage rattled over the cobbles were two savvy young American girls. Neither would ever forget Eugenie's allure. 13-year-old Jenny Jerome, later to become Lady Randolph Churchill and mother of Winston Churchill, would describe Eugenie as the handsomest woman in Europe. Sarah Delano, the future Mrs. James Roosevelt, mother of Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt, was a few months younger than Jenny, and she too gazed at the carriage, breathless with admiration. For these two girls, Empress Eugenie's public image epitomized the elegance of France's Second Empire, captured in Winterhalter's flattering portraits and the light-hearted operettas of Offenbach. Both girls probably assumed that Eugenie, the beautiful influencer, was doing exactly what was expected of a well-born wife, who could have no official role on her own account. She was being an agreeable asset to her husband. Yet the Empress's beauty and elegance had an extra layer, the glimmer of political power, thanks to her sway over her husband, who had ruled France in the, for the past 15 years. The ruthless Prussian statesman Otto von Bismarck would later call Eugenie, quote, the only man in Paris. Sarah and Jenny would have agreed that Empress Eugenie was a fascinating woman. They were unlikely to agree on much else. Jenny Jerome was captivated by the glorious pageantry of the spectacle because Jenny knew the value of a first-rate performance. Sarah Delano would have admired the demeanor of a woman who embodied imperial majesty. Sarah understood life in terms of duty. In the future, Jenny would use her charisma to secure her own choices. Sarah would shape her destiny through control of her wealth. I decided to write about these two figures because I'm fascinated by the way that whatever restrictions on their lives, women have made choices and shaped the space available to their own purposes. Neither Jenny Jerome Churchill nor Sarah Delano Roosevelt would have considered herself a powerful actor in the patriarchal society in which she lived, where financial and political power belonged to men and women were assessed almost entirely through the male gaze. At the same time, neither of these strong-willed women ever considered herself marginal to the society in which she flourished. Because they moved in such privileged circles, both had access to the leading lights of their time in politics and society, and both would use that access. Sarah and Jenny are such delicious opposites. One so relentlessly old-fashioned, the other so daringly non-traditional. With that and the fame of their sons, they seemed unnatural for a double biography. We may see them as trapped in ridiculous assumptions about women's roles, but that's not how they saw themselves. Their ambitious sons were lucky to have such formidable mothers. That was fantastic. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, let's start with these two women and why, I mean, Americans born just in this, you know, months apart. Um, how did you find them and realize that these two were connected this way? Well, I have to admit that it was my wonderful longtime editor, Phyllis Bruce. She and I were talking about what I might do next and she said, you know, you love writing about women. I haven't written exclusively about women, but I've always enjoyed exploring those lives. And she said, and you like writing, you, your first book was about the mother of William Lyon Mackenzie King. Let's have a look at some other mothers, and I'll tell you an interesting fact. Jenny Jerome Churchill and Sarah Delano Roosevelt 
were born in 1854 within a few miles of each other in New York. Imagine the mothers of the two probably most important men of the 20th century knew each other, were born so close together. What a coincidence. And that's all she said. <laughs> and I thought, what a coincidence. I must find out more about them. And that set me off. So you've done biographies of two women before, a double biography. Did it feel daunting to you to take it on again? Were you, after, after the Sisters in the Wilderness, did you think, oh, I want to do another one? <coughs> um, Was the form appealing to you again? Or did you think, oh, no, I should try to do one biography, another one? <laughs> it would have been easier to write a single biography. But I didn't think that either of these women, whose lives really, really interested me, I didn't really think that there was enough for me to do um, a single biography on either of them. Partly because, in fact, there have been a couple of very good biographies of Jenny, rather dated now, but still good. And also, with Sarah, there wasn't a lot of material. And the theme of the book is very much the contrast between them. Mm -hmm. Now, I had a huge frustration, which was, despite all my attempts, despite the number of times that they were in exactly the same place, uh, Manhattan in the 1850s, Paris in the 1860s, I never, and I know they must have been in the same room at various points, and I know that their families knew each other. I couldn't get them in the same room at the, sec at the um, same time. So I have no evidence that they met. And unfortunately, I'm a nonfiction writer, so I couldn't invent it. <laughs> but it's interesting because, um, you know, um, Jenny's father was, a, was at racetracks, and you know that um, the, the, uh, James was at... Yes, Sarah, Sarah's... Stepson. Yes. Uh, Rosie R Roosevelt. Rosie Roosevelt. Was at the By same the way, what her name? James Roosevelt Roosevelt? <coughs> they loved the name Roosevelt. I mean, as, uh, when, when, when Franklin Roosevelt married Eleanor Roosevelt, President Teddy Re Roosevelt was there to give Eleanor away, and he said, it's so good to keep the name in the family. <laughs> it's, it, <laughs> yes, they're a very close family. Once uh, those who have read the book will know what we're talking about, and those who haven't, you will find out. But yes, they were they were you know they played um, they w they went to the racetrack, so you kind of imagine that they would have um, seen each other. How could they not? Two f people from New York, from these families, even though they weren't exactly in the same circles. And I thought that was interesting to see the divide there between the Knickerbockers and those that didn't fit into a very elite class of people. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how, how you kind of place those two together? Both families were wealthy. And, you know, by standards today, they were both one percenters. They were in the very sort of upper levels of <clears throat> what became sort of Gilded Age society. But the... Delano's saw themselves as you know, old elite, very grand. There were lots of people who'd come over on the May May Mayflower in, uh, in the family, lots of um, forebears. And that, of course, is the sort of self-described aristocracy of the 19th century America. <clears throat> Whereas um, the Jeromes were gasp nouveau riche. In fact, Leonard Jerome, Jenny's father, um, was known as the King of Wall Street, and he made a lot of money, partly by sharp investing, a lot by insider trade, trading, and his fortunes went up and down. And <clears throat> he, he was um, not ever going to be acceptable to the old elite, the sort of land of Edith Wharton, the society of Edith Wharton. He would never have been accepted by them because uh, he was too flashy. And he built a huge mega mansion on, um, Fifth, on Madison Avenue and 
he By had, the way, the details of that party that he had, they were just to die for. Well, I know, and of course his wife, Clara, looked at what was going on, and he had, he was a very loyal husband. Not a faithful husband, a loyal husband. <laughs> but um, she looked at what was going on, and she knew this was no good for her three daughters' reputations. And so, although he's a very colorful character who's always sort of occupied a lot of space in the story of Jenny Jerome Churchill, it's actually, I realized, the mother who'd made all the savvy decisions that uh, ensured her daughter was going to have a famous husband. Well, I love, I, I mean, <clears throat> We were just talking about the details of the house. And what I loved about this book is that you do have these great sort of little flicks to the person, to what is happening around there. And one of them that we talked about was this one where Clara, on the grounds of the smoldering Tuileries Palace, Clara chanced upon an open air auction of imperial possessions. And she noticed a gilt edged dinner service with golden crowns and the initial N. And so she bought. She bought this, and her grandson, Winston Churchill, would relish using the service at Chartwell, his home in Kent, six decades later. I guess what I'm wondering is, when you have all these details, how do you not drown in details? How do you decide? Rigorous self-discipline. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to um, just, I've, you know, you, you find the details, and... The, the temptation is always just to stuff them all in. But in fact, then you drown in details. You're absolutely right. And it means the readers won't remember anything because there's just too much. Um, and so it's always the one, actually, that, you know, when I'm walking the dock, the one that stays in my mind, the detail about when Jenny Jerome Churchill, many, many years later, is... Uh, making money by flipping houses in London. She's now in her 50s. As usual, she's broke because she's unbelievable spendthrift. Um, it's the detail that, in fact, she... The electric light then was absolutely glaring, and she was renovating houses, and so she put a much softer um, colored bulb in all the lights so that nobody could see if a woman had any lines on her face. And uh, similarly... She did away with um, all the heavy Victorian paneling in, and painted uh, rooms a lovely sort of pale lemon, and which was, again, actually sort of and brought so much more light into the houses. And it's those kind of details, you know, and I could have given you sort of seven or eight more, but you only need one or two, like, oh, yes, I must get better bulbs in my house. Uh, you only need a few to sort of, as you're, as you're walking the dog or whatever you do to put your mind in neutral, that, you know, stay there, come, surf, come surfacing. And so do you do all your research before you start to write? Or are you researching while you're writing? What's that process like? It's so tempting to think you'll do all your research first because research is so much more fun than writing. Research is a treasure hunt. And research, you know, you go to the archives. Hopefully you go to the archives. I was really stymied with this book because it, I was writing it during the lockdown and I suddenly discovered the only thing I had access to was my own library and all the books that I could order on secondhand books uh, sales sites, websites. <clears throat> but even there, you know, you're looking for the details, you're looking for the story, you're constructing in each case for both women, sort of trying to see what their lives were like, trying to get inside what are they thinking. And so that could have taken me forever because these women belong to extremely well-known families which have been written out about a lot. But, um, you know, then there's such a thing as a deadline. Ah, I, and, I know about those. I was on deadline. I was like, oh, I'm driving deadline. <laughs> and so, and I do know that if I leave the writing to the last possible moment, I will shoot myself because I can't get it done. So I, I just in terms of, you know, talking to the publisher and establishing the contract, you map out each chapter. This is actually a big difference between fiction and nonfiction in the publishing world. 
Fiction, mostly publishers want to see a finished manuscript. Nonfiction, most publishers say, give me an outline, and then they give you a contract, you hope, uh, so that um, you can actually finance a, the lengthy process of actually writing a nonfiction book. So I had already constructed a fairly, um, fairly detailed outline of what, a paragraph for each chapter. And then you just slog your way through it. But you do research. You do a lot of research at the beginning. I do about six months. And then for each chapter, you know, I draw breath from having finished chapter three and then start amassing everything I need for chapter four and thinking about it and processing it and then get it done and then go on to chapter five. So all these details that you have, are you reading other things? You mentioned Edith Wharton. Are you reading other things at the time to help sort of fill in the, the, new, you know, the feeling of, of that time that, um, and just kind of helping you along to, to kind of place your mind there? Yes. With this book, primarily, the primary sources are going to be what has been written about these families and particularly about the two women. <clears throat> but in most of those sources, they are essentially secondary characters, secondary uh, people, uh, because it's the biographies of Churchill, it's the biographies of Roosevelt. Um, and then I, <clears throat> what was useful in that I couldn't go to the archives for the most part, was that, again, because they're well-known families, there were lots of collections of correspondence published. So I could actually hear their voices. I could sort of see what Jenny had written to Winston when, um, <clears throat> when he'd failed his exams again. And I could see what Sarah had written to Franklin when um, he, she felt that he had a grammatical mistake in his letter. And <clears throat> she, this was when both boys were at school, um, because that's all in collections of letters. Um, but then Edith Wharton was fabulous, a fabulous source on what the society in Manhattan was like in the late 19th century, particularly these social divides between the old Knickerbocker society, which was the <coughs> wealthy man. This is my COVID cough. I do beg your pardon. I've only had it for about 11 months, um, but it's not contagious. Uh, Edith Wharton was helpful then because <clears throat> she describes the, the society in which Sarah was moving. For Jenny, who moved from New York to Paris and then to London, um, Dickens was useful for the underside of um, London, obviously. And then there's a lot of um, <clears throat> really sort of good historical writing and uh, memoirs for the aristocrats of the period. What I, going back to these two women, they're very, in other biographies, or they, they have, you know, Jenny's the mother who is doing many other things, has lovers, and is, is not really there. Her son was given to, and then Sarah is this, Oh, controlling figure and sort of an ogre who, you know, uh, poor Eleanor. Um, how did you manage that and to show them as more than that and kind of give the truth of them? But well, I found that <clears throat> you know they'd always been seen through the lens of their sons, and so I'd started by reading the biographies of. Um, I didn't read all of them. There are over a thousand bio biographies and other books about Churchill. Uh, but I started reading the sort of the ones that are regarded as the best and the most important and, and the most recent. And I saw that Jenny was sort of constantly castigated for being the absentee mother and being heartless <clears throat> and... Sarah was, you know, constantly described as the smothering mother who 
um, never made Eleanor welcome. And then I thought, but that, those were opinions which are, come from biographies where the biographer, usually male, is writing about a great man of history, Winston and Franklin. And these are biographers who really don't want intrusive mothers in the story of how the great man of history sort of emerged almost sort of fully formed from the head of Zeus or whatever. And <clears throat> they, they aren't terribly interested in the early lives at all because they want to get on to the main event. And how did the women... What was it like when the women were actually living their lives? That's why I always wanted to go to the primary material. Jenny's letters, Sarah's diaries, whatever. And, of course, with Jenny what happened was this wonderful, charismatic ex extrovert, so gregarious, so bold, so she took incredible initiatives in her own life. She outfitted a hospital ship to go to South Africa during the Boer War and then sailed to South Africa on it. She founded a literary journal. She raised funds for the National Theatre. But all that anybody actually remembered her for was affairs. Uh, and it, the hypocrisy of that and the double standard at the time uh, during her own life and subsequent biographers I really annoyed me. And particularly because she was not a very conscientious mother in the early years. It's absolutely true. But she was actually doing exactly what many of her peers, other aristocratic ladies, were doing, <clears throat> which was farming her child out to a really reliable, responsible nanny, and then to schools that had good reputations. The fact that one of them was actually just a hotbed of sadists is neither here nor there. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't know that. What was actually going on was that her husband, Lord Randolph Churchill, was a horrible man and really, really not interested in his sons at all, very demanding of Jenny. He got progressively more and more ill, either with a brain tumor or with syphilis, and at the time they certainly thought it was syphilis. And she was looking after him and sort of dealing with his outrageous outbursts and the fact that he had a brilliant political career for about five years and then it abruptly ended when on, on impulse he resigned from being the Chancellor of the Exchequer thinking that the Prime Minister would come rushing back and say no no you can't leave in fact the Prime Minister said thank you for your resignation and then said to a friend who knowing that they have got rid of the boil on their neck invites it back <clears throat> so Jenny had serious preoccupations and once Lord Randolph dies her relationship with her son Winston improves quite markedly and they become very close and he becomes very dependent on her help to launch his own career the case with Sarah was that yes she was a very formidable woman but Fra she's shocked when Franklin becomes engaged to 19-year-old Eleanor. And at 19, Eleanor was quite a damaged young woman. She'd had the most miserable childhood. She had, um, her parents had died early. Her father had been an alcoholic. She never knew who was sort of going to take her in. She eventually lived with her grandparents where nobody really cared for her and her two uncles kept sort of taking pot shots out of windows at anybody who strayed onto the the grounds of their home. <clears throat> the, um, Eleanor um, was very, very grateful to her mother-in-law during the first years of her marriage because Sarah helped her so much with the family life, houses, children. Eleanor had six children in 10 years. Anybody who's had three children in five years knows exactly <laughs> how demanding that is, even if you have uh, servants and everything, as she did. And she relied so much on Sarah and depended on her. And Sarah's care for Eleanor and Franklin's children allowed Eleanor then to develop her own interests and her own career. In later years, she became very resentful 
of Sarah, because Sarah was intrusive. But Sarah wanted to make sure her grandchildren were okay, and Franklin and Eleanor often just weren't around. So, you know, as soon as you flip the picture and think not sort of <clears throat> what difficult women they were, but what challenges they had to face, you think, well, wait a minute, why are these biographers of the great men being so, why are they denigrating them? That was much too long, that answer. I'm so sorry. No, <laughs> but it, I mean, that's what it gets at, right? This, this idea that these, these women, um, they just sort of get swept up in people's biographies as these caricatures. And, and that's what this is about, is giving them a chance to be more than just a, a caricature, I guess, yes. Um, I just want to kind of go back to this idea of history. You know, um, there's a great quote where um, uh, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Um, I'm sure you know it. Uh, and L.P. Hartley. Yes, exactly. But it's a good one to keep in mind with yes. history, with biographies. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and how you think about that quote and, and, and what you think that brings to your work? You know, <clears throat> I've, I've often thought about that quote. It's been used until quite recently to justify the idea that people in the past did took actions which today we feel are reprehensible. In the United States, it's particularly in terms of slavery. In Canada, it's particularly in terms of the treatment of indigenous people. In Britain, it's particularly in terms of living off the profits of slavery. Um, so, you know, no country is free of <clears throat> the scar of a racism that was seen as respectable, um, certainly in the 19th century. And it used to be that the past is a different country. They did things differently. Um, just accept it and just accept that, you know, today we think differently about these issues. Well, history's moved on <clears throat> and today we don't, we don't give a free pass to people in the 19th century. And this is tricky because, you know, it's actually terribly um, morally superior of us to judge the past in that way. Uh, and, you know, I always say, I think in 50 years, people will be looking at us, actually in 20 years, and say, what were you thinking? Why were you driving all those cars? What do you think you're doing putting more carbon in the atmosphere? And why are you warehousing all your old people? I mean, there's a whole lot of things we just take for granted now that future generations might well deplore. On the other hand, you want to rethink history and say, yes, they did do things differently. <clears throat> um, so we've got to balance. You know, we've got to bring in more voices and we've got to um, make sure our history is inclusive so we know what's happening to everybody. But you don't throw out uh, the old narratives. You expand them. Well, that's what I thought was very interesting in this book. You do have that, especially, you know, that they weren't... When she was in China, she wasn't aware of what was happening to um, the people in China and uh, and so on and so forth. And so I thought that was an interest. This is kind of why I brought up that quote, because I was like, oh, it's interesting that you you did do that. And I, I was wondering if that was one of the reasons. I think very much so. I mean, Sarah, the Delano family was fortune was actually built on the opium trade, which, of course, is the fentanyl trade. Uh, the equivalent today is the fentanyl trade. So... Um, we all know what damage that's done. Um, but it's useful to remember that. I shall tell you a great story. I gave a talk at one point about Sir John. I, I, no, it was actually, I wasn't even talking about Sir John A. MacDonald. I was talking about 
um, my book, The Promise of Canada, and there were sort of portraits of people during successive decades of Canada. And there was, it was at a university, and there was a student in the front saying, who was just bursting to ask me a question. And the question was, you defended Sir John A. Macdonald when CBC was looking for the greatest Canadian. How could you do that? He invented residential schools. How could you do that? <clears throat> so I gave an answer, and she wouldn't let it go. Uh, she, you know, wanted to talk more about uh, what a morally flawed individual he was and how um, appalling it was, the legacy of the Fathers of Confederation. Anyway, I was telling, just to drop a name, I was telling Margaret Atwood about this and saying it's very hard dealing with students who don't have the big picture. And she said, why didn't you just ask the student, so you'd rather be American? I thought, oh, gosh, I wish I was that smart. <laughs> that Margaret, she's always got the one-liners there. Um, actually, I think we're get. oh, no, I think I've got five more minutes, right? Yeah. Um, so one of the things um, I was going to talk about is, um, actually, I lost my train of thought there because I was like, Margaret Atwood, and then I'm like, wait, what? What, what just happened? Um, let's go. Let's just go back to these two women and and sort of how they progress. Um, sorry, I've lost completely my train of thought. I wanted to go back and ask a question about these two women, and then I just lost it. Well, I can tell you that the joy of writing about them was that I wanted to both resuscitate them, make them real people, rather than just sort of the stereotype of bad mother, smothering mother, uh, make them into real individuals with their own lives, their own interests. And yet they were so, as I say in the introduction, so, such delicious opposites. It would be very easy, actually, because Jenny's so colorful and, you know, the wild spend. Was she your favorite? Was Jenny no, your favorite? No, it was actually, this was just like in Sisters in the Wilderness, where whichever one I was writing about was my favorite. Um, you know, that, that happens to biographers, that, you know, you get inside a character and you're sympathetic to her. Not necessarily, you know, you're not, I was, certainly wasn't blind to her faults, and she had them, both did. Um, but I, I loved the balance between them. Well, I was going, this is what I was going to ask, was when I read your fiction, I mean, I read your, your nonfiction, it reads like fiction. And I wonder, because you have a narrative, you have, your characters have dialogue that actually feel like you're listening to characters speak through it. Do you plan that? How, how, do, how do you plan that? How do you write that? You need a lot of good primary sources so that you can quote the vo their own voices from their letters and their diaries. Um, I never make dialogue up. Um, that's the issue for me with memoir. We tend to trust memoir and believe it's absolutely what happens. But of course, um, the memoirist is usually inventing the dialogue. And uh, I th often the vocabulary they use is actually anachronistic. It isn't somebody that, something that somebody would have said in 1950. They're using words you know, only came into currency 20 years ago. I would, so I rely very strongly on primary sources to get the dialogue right. And um, also, of course, with Eleanor, and the story of Eleanor and Sarah, which is a big part of the Sarah Roosevelt story, um, Sir Eleanor wrote three memoirs, and each was more critical of her mother-in-law as sort of distance. Uh, time went on and Eleanor herself became a much more considerable and um, self-confident individual. Um, and there's tons of dialogue that she puts in her memoirs, so I could use that. I mean, she, the conversation when she reproaches her husband for um, never giving her an option on what the house should look like when they move into a house in Manhattan. Um, 
she gave me the conversation and I just took it from her memoir. But that's the kind of... Um, you, you just have confidence in those voices because they're the voices. Well, actually, I'm almost out of time, but I, what I thought was interesting was that it was propulsive, just like fiction, where you're going through, and so you're not bogged down in... But it, it, it was, it's brilliant that you were able to do that because, yeah. The one thing I have learned about biography is that you don't have to give equal weight to every decade of life. Oh. And... Some decades more happens than others. And one of the things I learned in my first book, Mrs. King, about the mother of Mackenzie Lewis King, Mac sorry, William Lyon, William Lyon Mackenzie, that was the father, William Lyon Mackenzie King, the son, Mrs. King, the daughter of the first one, Mackenzie and the mother of King, you get lots and lots of sources for the last final years of your character. And I couldn't bear to say goodbye to her, so I spun out her death for three chapters. <laughs> and my, my editor kept writing in the, in the margin, I am getting bored. I am getting very bored. When is she going to die? <laughs> That's brilliant. So we're going to open it up to question and answers right now. There may be a mic circulating, but if not, you can just ask the question, and um, if anyone has any questions, um, please just put up your hand, and we'll get to you. Uh, someone at the back? Okay. Sorry, you should, uh, also, the lights are in my eyes, so I may not see you right off the bat, but there's somebody walking around. What were my sources? Um, yes, I do use secondary sources. I use books. I, <coughs> um, I mean, I, I know that some books I wouldn't rely on, and TV series, unless it's a um, Ken Burns documentary series, I probably would completely distrust any dramatization of lives of individuals, uh, particularly one that suggested Franklin Roosevelt had an affair with um, a member of the Danish royal family on the Atlantic, which was a really recent one. Um, uh, but the when I use a secondary source, I'm what I'm really looking for is any what what primary sources they've used, so I can chase them up, and also if they have facts or dialogue that I haven't found elsewhere. Um, and some of the biographies, of, one of the biographies of Jenny was outrageously mendacious. I mean, written by somebody who, with a real grudge against her. Uh, so you always have to, if you're using secondary sources, you have to think very carefully about who the writer is and what their particular spin on the story is and if you trust it. There's a woman in the back, and then the man in the pink shirt. Just to continue about the, the sources, um, you mentioned that you uh, your sources are also diaries and letters, those types of things. I'm wondering, um, with women of such prestige, are those sources like public sources? Like, how do you get a hold of um, the diaries of these people, that type of thing? Is, it, is that difficult? With these two individuals, of course... Um, there are marvelous family collections. So there's the FDR Presidential Papers, uh, Presidential Library at Hyde Park, which is right next to uh, Springwood, the house that um, Sarah w went to when she married James Roosevelt, and then the house where Franklin was born and the house in which Sarah died. So there's terrific, there was material there and then with the Churchill archives, the uh, Churchill College, Cambridge, has uh, its own dedicated archives for the 
Churchill family. That being said, we had lockdowns for, what, three years, and I couldn't go to those archives. So I was relying on all these other sources or anything that was a, a, available digitally. And one of the, when I finally got to each of them, not for nearly as long as I would have liked to, but you know, the great pleasure was making sure when I looked at the letters that had been published elsewhere, that I, you know, I hadn't missed anything because the editor of the letters had um, edited them. And also that I could see the handwriting and I could actually sort of touch the, the, the paper that they had written to their sons or to others on. Or that, and I could see that Jenny's letters were written in this wonderful, wild, sloping um, script that kept sort of going off at the page and was, you know, obviously written in a great hurry because she was always sort of dashing off to something. And Sarah's were neat and instructive. I mean, you just feel such vindication when you think, yes, they are exactly the way I f think they were. You know, um, th there was a thing in your book about the diaries going, the, the, whether she got rid of them because maybe there was trouble in the, in the marriage. Um, this is the Sarah, yes, Rosebud. Sarah and her husband. They they seem to be so aligned, and then suddenly there's this missing period, um, which was also instructive in some ways when you don't have. Yes, somebody had torn out the two years. There's a, there's a period when there are missing pages, and it's probably a period when, when Sarah, when Franklin Roosevelt was born, uh, it was a terribly painful birth. And uh, it's likely that the doctor said to Sarah that she should never have a chi another child. And <coughs> it's possible that um, uh, at that point, she and her husband James stop having any kind of physical relationship. And one biographer, in fact, the, one of the best biographers has suggested that's what happened in the min missing pages. And I, I do think that, um, and James doesn't have very good health at this point anyway, because he's 26 years older than uh, Sarah. And um, I think that's probably what happened after the birth of Franklin, they ceased having any kind of sexual relationship. And the weird parallel is that it's likely that um, Jenny stopped having any kind of sexual relationship with her husband soon after the birth of uh, her second son. Um, he probably, he thought he had syphilis and he knew that this was very dangerous for uh, and very contagious. So they also probably at a very early stage in, their, in her life, very uh, young age, she also ceased having sexual relationships with her, with her husband. What happened, of course, is it didn't seem to bother Sarah. She had a son. She was going to get on with her life. James dies. She never remarries. Jenny obviously has more of a libido than, <laughs> you know, but as I say, she had a libido. Get over it. Uh, she starts having affairs, then her husband dies very early. Sarah had married a man 26 years older than her. Jenny goes on to marry first one and then a second, a, well, first a second and then a third husband, both of whom are the same age as Winston, her son. That's just an illustration of the contrast between these two women. Uh, the, the second part of your book is called Powerful Sons. And I'm wondering, uh, given these uh, very um, strong character mothers and the powerful sons, what were the particular traits that you perhaps saw uh, passed on from Jenny and uh, from uh, Mrs. Roosevelt to the sons? There must have been some that struck you very, very strongly. I think two things. The first was both mothers who raised their sons in their maternal styles were totally different, except that both imbued in their sons a sense that these boys, these young men, were destined for great things, that they were extraordinary young men, and they were, you know, just 
very, very special. And so it gave each of them a kind of rock-solid ego, which Lord knows any leading politician needs, <laughs> even then, but especially now. The second thing I said was that <coughs> a child's primal relationship is with their mother. And it affected the way they, it, they both had very particular relationships with their mothers, particularly in the early years. Winston was always begging for his mother's attention, and he would, it would be a, he would try and get it by a combination of bullying and charm, temper tantrums, um, attempts at sort of seduction in, in the broadest possible way. And how does he treat people when he's prime minister? Same thing, actually, bullying, charm, temper tantrums. Some of it's his character, but some of it's nurture. Similarly, Roosevelt had this very devoted mother who always wanted to be close to him. He developed a lot of strategies for keeping her at arm's length, sort of um, smiling, making her feel good, saying what she wanted to hear, but never actually revealing to her what was going on in his, in his mind, in his head. It was a complete shock to her when he got, mar he got engaged to Eleanor. He had, she had no idea that Eleanor was playing any kind of role in, the, in his life. Similarly, when he is a leading politician, how does he treat people? You read these memoirs of uh, government officials who said they were in the White House, they had a meeting with the president, they went in, it felt like such a good meeting, he was so charming. They'd leave the room, the president's room, and realize they hadn't got a thing they asked for. <laughs> so it, the, they each had a style that really you can see the beginnings of in their relationships with their parents. We have time for one more question. Okay, so similar to the question in the car earlier, if these two women were alive today, what would you want to ask them? Something that you maybe didn't get to you know, find in the research or you wanted to include, but you just couldn't get the answer? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, well, with Sarah, I would ask, Sarah was essentially a very private person who becomes a very public person when um, Franklin becomes president. When, in 1932, when he is inaugurated for his first, after the first of his four elections as president of the United States, um, whose cover is on the cover of Time magazine? Not Franklin Roosevelt's, but his mother, Sarah Roosevelt, is on the cover of Time magazine. She thought politics, when she was growing up, she thought it was dirty, nasty business. She didn't want Franklin to go into politics. In the end, she plays quite a a subtle role in his presidency, which I won't talk about now, but I would like to ask her, did she like being a public personality? And with Jenny, I'd ask her, who is the father of the second son? <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming out to this event. Oh, Judith, thank you so much for your preparation and participation. Charlotte, thank you for returning to Kitchener Library to share your latest book and your insight into two fascinating women with us. And as quoted in Quill and Choir, readers familiar with Gray's meticulously researched biographies of 19th and early 20th century women, including poet Pauline Johnson, suffragette Nellie McClung, and the mother of Prime Minister Mackenzie King have come to expect engaging characters alongside a detailed evocation of the sights and sounds of a particular period. We cannot wait to see which secondary characters you select to bring to the forefront next and extend an open invitation for you to return to our stage. Please join me one more time in thanking Charlotte and Judith for tonight's conversation.